Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming down. Thank you very much for staying to the very end of the Korea Blockchain Week. Um, it's our pleasure to have you here and it's my pleasure to be seated alongside some of the three biggest OGs in the whole metaverse digital ownership field. Um, my name's Edward, uh, I'm part of Hash and I'm growing the Southeast Asia team and I'm based in Singapore. So thank you very much. I know I'm the only one stopping you guys between dinner and your side events and your drinks. Uh, I'd like to kick things off with an introduction from the panelists over here. Brian? Hey guys, yeah, just to echo Ed, I, we really appreciate you guys staying and uh, we'll try to keep this fun and light. My name is Brian, I'm the co-founder at Republic. Uh, we run an advisory firm as well as an investment platform um, based in Los Angeles. Really stoked to be sharing the stage with uh, Alan and Seb. So uh, yeah, hopefully we make this thing fun and interesting for you guys. Hello everyone, I'm Alan, CBO at Animoca. Um, so I run our investment and partnership team and also the ecosystem support that we provide to the 400 companies we have in our portfolio. Uh, before Animoca, I was uh, running FinTech at Tencent, uh, running the insurance that provide service to 100 million users. I had a different head uh, and that's why being in Seoul this week is very exciting. Uh, I'm on the board of a couple of museums. So Freeze uh, Seoul is happening right now. So for those of you that's done with the blockchain side of things, go check it out as well. Hello everyone, thank you for making it through the day and keeping the energy. We're still in the middle of the week, there's a lot going on in Career Blockchain Week. I'm glad to be back on stage one more year. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of The Sandbox, uh, as well as the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance. It's a sandbox, it's a decentralized virtual world where anyone can become a creator, start making their own assets and experiences, truly own them, monetize them the way they want. Yeah, you know, Sandbox, Animoca, Republic have been around for north of five years now. You know, these guys have been building in the space and I don't think, I mean, especially during a bear market, you see everybody waning away. You see projects dropping off. These guys have been around for a long time. Maybe I'll pose this question to the panelists over here. What have kept you guys motivated um, throughout this bear market? What's kept you guys going? And what kept you started in the first place? Oh, yeah, I thought Seth, so. I think like we share the same uh, passion and vision that we had from the very beginning. And not the beginning of crypto and blockchain, but the beginning of Sandbox back in 2011. Our vision has always been like, how do we empower anyone to become a creator using new technologies? So it started with smartphones back then, just touch screen, allowing people to create content without any programming, any specific skills, share that content online with others, and enjoy. Um, after quite a success, 40 million downloads, um, over eight years, 60 product updates, and 70 million uh, player-made creation shared. We also found along the way that uh, living out of passion and sharing your creation to others wasn't enough to keep creating creators engaged, retain them over years. And somehow, like, if creators dedicated their time, their energy, and contributed to grow a game, grow a platform, uh, to become bigger and to earn more revenue, and they couldn't receive a portion of that revenue for themselves, it was unfair, and they would be moving out to the next platform that gives them more value for their time. And due to various limitations on the stores uh, back then, it was not possible to share a revenue back to those creators. So we were really confronted to that issue, and we, we, we hadn't found a solution until 2017 that we discovered blockchain and actually NFTs. Back then, it was just simple virtual cats that you were breeding. If those of you, any one of you knows CryptoKitties in the audience, like you've been a long time in the industry, and we thought like NFT could be used for like bigger things than just virtual cats. Anyone could make their NFTs. And from there, that's really how uh, Setbox kept on for five years. Uh, we had always this vision of like developing products, developing exciting content with those products, like our 3D editor, our no-code game maker, and growing an ecosystem around the world of uh, agencies, creators, studios that will leverage those products uh, to develop new experiences, a new format of entertainment that will engage and bring in more, more creators in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody doesn't know CryptoKitties here? Right, so everyone's very OG here as well. Uh, Alan, how about you? What kept you guys motivated across this period? 
So I came from a Web2 background, so I, I think Tencent is as centralized as it gets when it comes to um, uh, data and, and, the, and the way we work in the ecosystem. So therefore, you know, when I start hearing about Web3 and the technology and what it enables around digital property rights, I think it just makes a lot of sense for me. But, but I think the, the, the stimulus was really, you know, I mentioned I was, I'm quite involved with arts. I collect myself. I'm, I'm, I'm on a couple of museum boards. It's really understanding what Web3 can do to creators. And I think Sam mentioned it a little bit, right? The idea that, you know, creators can cut out the middleman and can go straight and they can really own what, what, what they've created but also earn a royalty continuously going forward. You know, I think that really was, you know, a eureka moment for me. And I think, you know, I can be doing a lot of fun things combining the two communities that have always been, you know, one is technology and the other is culture, right? And it's not just restricted to, when I say art and, and creator, it's not just res restricted to sort of visual arts, right? Uh, actually, one of the uh, things that I'm really looking for t forward to um, tomorrow is uh, together with Sandbox, we're doing an event called Dance Fight. So it is a company that we've invested in together. And they, we've done one edition of it in New York, which is we bring street dancer and basically capturing the moves and turning that into a, an NFT, basically an avatar that you can play in sandbox. Right. And, and that way, basically, we, we capture the art form uh, in, uh, in an asset that they can actually own and sell. So, you know, think about during COVID, a lot of these dancers, you know, they don't have an opportunity to perform. But now with this technology, it allows them to actually own and monetize their craft. And I think that really is a very touching story for me. And that's when art and, so I should say, culture and technology comes together. And I think that, for me, really motivates me. Right, so if you're a street dancer amongst the crowd, this is who you're looking for, you want to get tokenized, you want to be on Sandbox. Well, uh, one Ryan, quick note on that, like, you're all invited tomorrow, we'll have, uh, <laughs> in the afternoon, with Sandbox organizing a demo day, you can meet 14 of like, the Korean creator studios that have been building, they'll showcase what they do in Sandbox, and we'll have this performance yeah. with Dance Fight, which is just one example among the hundred of like, how it's actually making a real impact for creators, changing people's life and creating new jobs. Awesome, awesome. How about you, Brian? What, what, what got you started in this whole field, building in the metaverse? Yeah, I think uh, really to, to echo uh, Alan and Sebastian's sentiments, it is really the uh, ability for people, especially creators, to find a more democratized way to show off their creations, be properly monetized for it, and also have mass distribution. I think for me, I, I actually want to take it one step a little bit higher, which means the true democratization of like financial access to things. Um, that's really meaningful for me, and that keeps me going uh, in Web3 because uh, you know I don't come from a lot of money growing up, and when I first got exposed to Web3 and blockchain, I saw the potential of people being able to disrupt entire financial systems and create brand new um, primitives, create brand new businesses that can create uh, the next generation of wealth. And uh, the biggest thing that I noticed at that time was there wasn't really a framework nor a technical architecture for these to really scale. So we made it our mission at Republic to create not only a compliant framework for Web3 technology, but also to help work with the strongest projects to guide them through how to properly build in the metaverse or to just generally build Web3 infrastructure. And uh, being able to see that the purpose of doing this is to create this democratization of finance uh, keeps me driven. And the last thing I wanna add that keeps me driven is actually all these conferences and all these people. Uh, I think anybody here, you'll probably be able to say this, uh, the people that you see at these conferences are, are like basically your friends. Like you hang out with these people, we're, we're, got, we're gonna go to some after parties tonight. Uh, it's always a really great reunion, catching up with everybody in Web3. I used to come from a traditional tech company and the conferences that I went there were like super not the same. They were very transactional, pretty boring. There's never like, you know, cool booths and swag music, none of that stuff. So it's quite a unique working experience. So not only am I driven by the technology and what it can become, I'm also driven by being surrounded by really interesting people. And I'm being driven by how fun the experience is just like existing and building in Web3. Right, and I think all of us can fully agree with that. Uh, and you know, I came from my private equity background 
couple of years back ago, uh, working in traditional finance back in Singapore, when I attended events, when I attended meetings, it was nothing like this. And I think Alan can agree with that as well, right? I mean, coming from a Tencent background, it might be very different, like big tech background. Maybe switching gears a little bit, um, you know, Alan, you mentioned earlier about uh, street dancers and like trying to give them a lot of forms of engagement. How do you see the metaverse um, creating different forms of engagement apart from this event that you're doing? And I think it goes to you know, NFT and what it en enables, which is digital property ownership, right? So what, one of the examples where, where we've been spending a lot of time on is in education. So you know, of course, uh, people would know blockchain has been in entertainment, in sports, in music, in games, but education, we really think there's a lot of potential. And uh, a project we've launched recently is called Open Campus. So what we do is basically we take existing courses that are selling on Web2 platforms, so it's got a revenue and cash flow behind it, and we're tokenizing that, to your point about financialization, tokenizing that into NFT for people to buy. So, you know, that inject liquidity into education, which we all think, you know, I think we all agree is a very important sector, but it does a lot more than that. So I think to answer your question on how it changed the relationship with ownership, so one of the examples is, you know, we've got someone in Japan that bought one of these course NFT. And instead of just owning it and, you know, basically claiming the dividend and the cash flow from it every month, she said, hey, you know what, I, I think this is now in English, but there's a real potential for this in the Japanese market. So she's going to localize it and start distributing it, co-publishing it in Japanese. So I think that's the kind of... Um, impact that we're going to see, which is once you own something, you have an incentive to make it better, to find more ways to monetize it, to sell it, to publish it. So, you know, I think that, you know, we, we're seeing it in, in other areas as well, in games. Uh, one of the things that we've launched um, a couple of weeks ago is a game that we did together with Yuga called Rec League. And, you know, it's also transforming the way that people would own game assets. So we, in Web3, you buy a game asset, you hope that value would go up, right? But in this one, you own the game asset and you would lease it to people that would be playing it in the future on the Web2 mobile platform. Right? So again, it creates a very different incentive for people to not just hold it and you know, expect capital appreciation, but everyone who owns the NFT will have an incentive to market, to go tell everyone about this, because they own this, they're going to profit from this. Right? So I think that's what you know, I see Web3 can do with NFTs. Yeah, I mean, creating different forms of engagement comes in many forms. It can be a create, you can just be a teacher, you can be a dancer, and this is where all these platforms, whether it's Sandbox, whether it's Animal Walker Brands, whether it's Republic, they are putting things together and building an infrastructure for you to grow. And I think that's the beauty of where we are in the, in the blockchain field right now. Uh, Seb, what do you think of that? Well, I, I would echo a lot what Alan said. Like, I think it really uh, opened up new opportunities um, through first like the type of experience that you can find in Sandbox. They are quite different than what you would find on other platforms. They are avatar-centric, they are more social. They are not really your traditional game. Uh, if you were expecting something as a gamer, it's really a mixture around like discovery, exploration, socialization, and uh, sometimes like completing quests. Uh, it touches also education, and it can touch, of course, like music, gaming, sports, and other. Um, I think there's also really that a very specific culture of uh, being more inclusive, bring more diversity. The diversity of creators that you can find in Sandbox is quite unique. And why is that? It's because of the accessibility of our game maker, which is really uh, no code. That means like suddenly you have a platform where different type of creator, people who have not evolved in the game industry for 10 years like us, so they can like bring new ideas, they can bring new type of content with their own heritage, their own culture. Uh, it helps other countries that were kind of left behind because of the Web 2 model or free-to-play model to uh, rise on the scene, on the global scene in Web 3. That's really why we're seeing Sandbox so much developing. For example, 40% of our business now is in Asia with our creator our ecosystem there. And um, behind, like, have um, also a very different culture in terms of, like, how we're not competing with each other at the end of the day. We're really collaborating. Like every new project, we want them to be successful because like through a successful project, new users will come in, they will own their uh, identity, their wallet, and they can move between application in a seamless manner, bringing with them their digital asset, utilizing them, building other application on top of it. So there is really this culture of like collaboration, supporting each other in the space, and developing a network effect 
which is very often seen, for example, with what we call interoperability, like if you own an asset in this game, or if you own a profile picture collection, or you're part of a community, let me uh, utilize it in Sandbox as well to play as your avatar and start like expanding your universe, uh, de developing new skills for your community, like making them more creative, learning uh, new things, and engaging them in different ways. So this is just an example, but I think like it should be really, for me that's one of the main characteristics that we're seeing in Web3 and how like this paradigm shift is going to impact profoundly uh, like that new generation of user and hopefully also users from Web2. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Brian, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so the, the question was like how, the, the, how does ownership transform, right? From physical, physical to digital. Um, I think I want to add a different perspective to this, which is that I believe that Web3 is actually coming at a very uh, good inflection point where the next generation of people uh, are uh, very used to a digitally native world. And their concept of ownership of digital items, think of uh, you know, currency in Roblox or skins in Counter-Strike, whatever, in Web2, is what they grew up doing, right? Especially people that are like in middle school and high school today, this is what their world is. And blockchain is now creating a way to actually represent ownership in this world for real. So I think that the advent of metaverse and NFTs, uh, which should be um, just new ways to think about true digital verifiable ownership is coming at a time where a digitally native generation is also coming online. So I believe that it's just gonna be a natural way for people to think about what they own. And uh, blockchain is just a, a way to enable that. Uh, I also wanna touch on one point that you made, Alan, that I thought was really great, which is once you own these things, you can you like truly own the IP, you know, depending on what the legal rights are. But when you own a digital asset uh, on, on chain, then you can actually, like you said, market it, sell it, and you're incentivized to make that piece of IP uh, awesome, which is different from maybe owning a uh, Mickey Mouse figurine and like you don't really have an incentive to publicize it more because you're not benefiting from it. But if you own a uh, NFT of a cartoon that was generated by someone's collection, but by owning that, you actually own the IP, you are now incentivized to like plaster that cartoon on water bottles, uh, put it on t-shirts, even create a, what, a restaurant that sells things with that face on it, because you will actually benefit and you're actually allowed to do it, which didn't exist before. So I think that concept of uh, digital ownership and physical ownership is really changing and it'll be really cool to see how it evolves uh, moving forward. Yeah, and I see a lot of that sort of going into the social fear as well. I think the most recent kind of talk about digital ownership comes in the form of friend tech, which I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, you're tokenizing social networks, which I think is something that hasn't really been explored yet, but you see them raking in a lot of fees as a protocol and whatnot. Um, you talked a little bit about digital ownership and physical ownership. I wanna pose this question maybe to Seb. Um, you guys are selling land on Sandbox. Right. If I've got X amount of money, why maybe why should I think about buying a digital piece of land on Sandbox over something that's physical out there in the real world? Well, I I, I believe like like we described before, like more and more people are going to spend time interacting and uh, having jobs and participating into uh, this virtual and digital world economy. In this space, like you have an avatar, you interact with others, you spend time creating, and you will want to have an ownership in the world or the platform that you contribute to building. So that's what essentially a virtual land represents on a platform like Sandbox. It's part of a map, and that map uh, all together, in the case of Sandbox, is 166, 164 land, represent that ownership of that virtual world that you contribute to build. You, uh, Owning the land is the key to access monetization. And it's much easier, specifically when you're already spending, like Gen Z today, like 12 hours a week in the virtual world. Yeah. You prefer to own a piece of the place where you understand the mechanics. You understand how to grow an audience. You understand how to engage and potentially monetize it versus owning a piece into a physical world, everything from thousands of years of history and on the a concept where like the price of the 
market doesn't really reflect your own effort and you have literally no control over it. Mm. And frankly speaking, for that next generation, that Gen Z and next generation, like it's, getting, it's going to be harder and harder for them to actually have uh, physical property, specifically on the physical real estate market. I'm thinking of cities like New York, Hong Kong, Paris, etc. Like, like yeah. the average age to become an owner is becoming above 40 years old. And even though they are like working hard, etc. In virtual world, they have access to be the pioneers of building those worlds that will last. We've seen Second Life, we've seen Eve Online. Those worlds will last 20, 30 years, maybe more. And because they are intrinsically in it, they understand it. I think it's just logical to, to, to go into it fully. Gotcha, gotcha. And, you know, Ellen, from your time investing and being the CBDO for Animoca, have you seen any advantages of digital ownership over physical ownership? Any bottlenecks, any drawbacks? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think one of the most interesting aspects is the permissionless aspect of it. So you can own something and, you know, as we've talked about, you know, people, once they own it, they have a different incentive to market it, to make it more valuable. But also, you know, there's also this very interesting permissionless aspect, right? So, for example, like the, the Yuga, and I think everyone knows that case very well. Um, of course, you know, Yuga themselves would provide a lot of utility to board apes, but because of the brand and, and what they've built, there's a lot of people that's offering uh, benefits and utility to board ape holders in, in a permissionless fashion, right? And I think that doesn't happen all that easily in, in the web too well. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of that happening in our own NFT collection called Mochaverse, right? So, you know, obviously we've created a lot of, you know, games and events and benefit that we're delivering from, from us, from the project, but also there's a lot of people that are just reaching out and, you know, they are just reaching out directly to the Mochaverse community and said, you know, this is for you and you're on the whitelist, right? So these are all things that I think was much harder in the web too well. And I think now is very different and interesting in the web three well. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And, you know, I think a lot of them have mentioned a lot about NFTs and using NFTs in their ecosystems, in the metaverses. Um, how do you see NFTs sort of being interoperable between different metaverses? Will there be one metaverse that you see that dominates the field? Or will there be multiple metaverses and therefore multiple NFTs in each metaverse that exists in there? Maybe I'll kick this off with Brian. Yeah, that's a good question. I think this actually comes down to a Web3 infrastructure discussion. And uh, currently, there's a, a lot of projects that are trying to bridge different layer one, layer two ecosystems together. Uh, there's even projects that are called like a layer zero, which is kind of like a common denominator across multiple layer one and layer two protocols that are on different languages that don't typically will talk to each other. I think that once we solve something like that, where there is true cross-chain interoperability with different uh, blockchain ecosystems, then you can have a seamless flow of digital assets across uh, different universes. Um, so once that infrastructure is solved, which I think there are many projects working on it today, then we can have a world where I get like a super cool skin for my gun on a Solana game, but then I can also transfer that to a different game that's built on Polygon or something like that. Uh, currently, you can't do that today uh, for many reasons, but I think that future should exist because I, you know, as a gamer myself, really like the idea that NFTs and Web3 allow you to uh, showcase the amount of work you put into a certain game and then have that be present with you as you go from game to game. Uh, and I think that's a really cool um, feature that should really be explored and can really um, add to the player experience um, and doing that across not only different games within the same ecosystem, like you could do that within Blizzard today, sure, but doing that across games in different universes and worlds and even companies uh, would be really, really cool to see. So these are all suggestions, feedbacks, and ideas for the builders in the room, developers in the room. If you guys are thinking of something to build, you're hearing from the top minds uh, in the metaverse space, in the digital ownership space. Uh, so do take a note. Um, Ellen, anything you want to add on that front? NFT interoperability. Yeah, I, I think th maybe this is where the virtual world is behind the real world. Because imagine this, right? I mean, I like this jacket. I'm wearing it in Hong Kong. I want to bring it to Seoul to wear. You know, of course, I like it. I want to bring it to Seoul to wear. 
but it's not possible right now in the metaverse, right? Because you know, of you know, cross-chain issue and you know, the fact that there's, everyone had a different commercial interest, right? So I think this is where actually the virtual world is behind the real world, right? I can, I can wear this in New York and, 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 and in Tokyo, right? So, but, but people are solving it, right? So layer zero is solving it. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of cross-chain solution right now, technically. And I think commercially, we're also seeing companies doing that. Another company that you know, is part of uh, the animal portfolio that you know, I think SAP knows very well because we, they work with Sandbox as well is uh, BNV, right? So they do digital wearables and you know, they would create something that is wearable in Sandbox but you know, wearable in different metaverses as well. But you know, that requires quite a lot of commercial negotiation. And you know, I, I, I hope that you know, as we move forward with the cross-chain solution, then you know, there's less friction in that. And you know, hopefully it will catch up to the real world sooner. Got it. How about you, Seb? Well, back to the question. Like, first of all, like, I absolutely don't wish just only one metaverse, one virtual right. world platform yeah. takes it all. Like, we don't want to fall back in, into Web2 worlds. Like, what's the point of decentralization if there's only one place to go? We want to see myriad of worlds, different niche, different, I don't know, aesthetics, different ways to interact on platform, and hopefully all supported by this idea of, like, uh, being part of the open metaverse and blockchain, so that set can be transferable. Um, there is a few working groups and associations that are actually working on some of the challenges that you describe on the technical standpoint. Uh, the two names that comes is the Metaverse Standard uh, Alliance, or f no, the Metaverse Standard Forum, that was MSF, that was the first one that launched, and it accounts already over a thousand members, including Epic, Adobe, uh, Microsoft, Roblox, etc. They're very concentrated on a uh, technical topic of like file format, special interaction, etc. There is also the Open Metaverse Alliance, which Animoca Brands, Sandbox, uh, and many other companies like uh, Upland, Alien Worlds, uh, Decentraland, etc. are part of. And it's been already over a year, so they've started a certain number of working groups. They have regular, we, we have regular board meeting, and we discuss on topics like uh, portaling, how do we move uh, between different applications on different platforms in a seamless manner, uh, different uh, interoperability, and also the, the rights associated with assets, and so on. There's some progress, some papers are being published already, so if you're interested on the topic, it's quite uh, interesting. Still, at the end of the day, I, all those challenges exist, and they will need to be solved, but I'm also very practical as an uh, entrepreneur, I think like what people care about is like so what so how, what can I do concretely with that? So we try to also attack like concrete example like you own an NFT and hopefully this is one of the top 70 most popular NFT collection on Ethereum or Polygon. You can already play with it in Sandbox as a 3D avatar, and you literally had nothing else to do than just connect your wallet. It comes straight off the box. And that's it. You can c start exploring world, connecting with others, uh, exploring a bit new possibilities. And we also regularly engage the users who own those NFTs by offering special rewards. So in a way, we onboard them toward like, all the different possibilities that uh, exist in the space thanks to interoperability and show them like, uh, like one asset can have multiple use cases, can have multiple representation, and it overall benefits to the value of their asset and to the communities that where those assets were originally created from in this ethos of like uh, collaboration and generating network effect among like communities. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. And again, for all those metaverse enthusiasts in the field, uh, don't give up hope. There's going to be multiple universes, I think, on, on chain. And so keep building, create a new narrative, keep trying. And these are the brains you want to tap on. These are the guys that you want to pitch your ideas to when the time comes. Um, just a last question to the panelists over here. Uh, we really thank them for their time. And how far off do you think we are uh, to mass adoption? Like on a scale of let's say zero to 10, uh, and you can rank that in terms of number of years, mass adoption of the metaverse, uh, how far off do you think we are at that point? Uh, Brian? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll keep it a little bit short, and I think it depends on how you define metaverse, because is it a Web3 metaverse or uh, you know, the, the Facebook metaverse or something like that, right? I, I would argue that a lot of people are already living in a digitally native world by playing in video games. That's the first step to being in the metaverse. Now, if you're talking about a Web3-enabled metaverse with like permissionless access and true ownership, I do think we're a little bit far, uh, call it three to five years away. I don't know, actually these guys might know better than I do. Um, but 
and I'm coming from it from a more technology standpoint, I think that the infrastructure, the interoperability still has a long way to go. Yeah, I, I think similar. So I would define it a little bit more broadly. So I would say when is mass adoption for Web3 is going to happen? And I think it's taking two steps, right? In fact, you know, I, I think just in the previous session, I hear that there's 100 million wallets right now only, yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think there's still a lot more people that need to get on board. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of islands, actually. So if you think about all the custodial wallet that's being opened, especially by the big Web2 brands, I think we're going to see that phase coming, and you know, there's going to be a lot more people in Web3, and then there's going to be another step where these things are actually connected. So, you know, five year plus is my guess. Okay, cool. If you ask me, like, I think like within 10 years, everyone will have an NFT, NFT will have a wallet, etc. Okay. Does that mean that we'll have uh, one billion users already into a metaverse? That's still to be built, like the technology, the product to support that. Uh, we've seen that it can take decades to achieve like a uh, platform like Roblox, like Fortnite, like Minecraft. Let's, we're just five years into building Sandbox, so that would give us at least five or ten more years to reach that level, and let's see how things go. Awesome. So I think the rough idea is that it's about five, five to ten years from now. Brian's a little bit optimistic, three years for him. Uh, but, you know, everyone has different definitions of mass adoption. I uh, really want to thank you guys all for your time. I want to thank the panelists a lot for their time as well. And thank you all for staying. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.